Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Thus far the reading of God's Word this morning. Now, Paul begins chapter 5 with the word, therefore. And that begs the question, of course, right off the bat, as to what what point it was driving at previously that he now wishes to bring to a conclusion. And if this was the only time that Paul used the word, therefore, in this letter... It would indeed require us to ask that question. What has he been pressing before that he now is bringing to that great finality of his argument? But the therefore Paul writes here in chapter 5 verse 1 is not the climactic watershed uh, turning of an argument that you might think it to be. In fact, Paul actually uses the word therefore 11 times in this letter. Paul is telling us, as as the whole of his writing unfolds, that there is a unity, there is a development of thought that he continues to build, first establishing that one significant lesson he wants us to understand, and then building on it, and building on it, and building on it, and building on it, and building on it as the letter goes forward. So the first time he writes the word, therefore was back in chapter 2. He said, Therefore, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh. And the point he was trying to make there was one of contrast. You, Christian, were once in the world. You were once worldly. Like all others around you, you were lost in sin. You were... uh, lost to the blessing of God with nothing but misery in this life, the pain of death to anticipate, and the dread of eternal judgment to come. But God, who is rich in mercy, has withheld His his judgment upon you, and instead He has given you grace in Christ Jesus your Lord, by which you have been forgiven. You have been redeemed and brought into the fold of God's people, the church of Jesus Christ. That change, that one contrast, you see, is the main point of this entire letter. That's the one thing he's been stressing. Be aware of this great contrast that has happened in your life, believer. Once you were in the world, now you are called out of the world. That is his most important point to learn. Now, the second time he uses the word therefore was in chapter 4. He said there, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, here is the the how. Here is the application of the change. You have beheld the glory of God and His saving work in your life, and now you are called, according to that, to live by it. And how are you to do that? How are you to live according to the calling of God? He says, by walking in a manner worthy according to your calling. You are to glorify God in your everyday countenance. Every Christian is called to glorify God even in his most mundane and routine of habits. Now, the word worthy, you might remember, means to live your life with humility and gentleness and patience, being eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. You remember that from from our previous study? Now, the fourth time the therefore is used is chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, here again. Here again, we're reminded of the nature of this contrast between our old worldly selves and our new redeemed selves. Truth is part of our our new spiritual nature. 
And because of that, we must be putting away all worldly ways, putting away all that we used to weigh, all the ways we used to speak, all the ways we used to live. We're to put away falsehood, he says, falsehood in the way we think, falsehood in the way we reason, falsehood in the words that we say, falsehood in the priorities that we go by, the choices that we make in our lives. And now this morning we come to the fifth, therefore, chapter 5, verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Now we see that this verse is not some watershed turning point, dramatically built up to and and bringing his his argument to a conclusion. Rather, we see this is the continuing enlargement of everything that he has said before, once he makes that single point, that contrast. This is how you were, now is how you are. But this description with which he begins in chapter 5, be imitators of God, I think that probably takes a little explaining. How does one imitate God? What exactly does he mean by that? Well, the word in the Greek... Of course, we have to start back there. The word in the Greek is mimetas, and it means mimic or imitation. And you know, while some translations of the Bible use the word followers, be followers of God, imitators really does carry the best meaning. So we're stuck with the word. But still, at first glance, such a statement of this seems rather foolish for us to contemplate, doesn't it? God is completely above us. He's not even a part of creation. He is apart from all He has created. He is all-powerful. He alone can do all His holy will. We are not like that. But clearly, Paul is writing sincerely here, so he must have something in mind for us to understand. He wants us to expand our thinking to the point where we can put this into practice. But what can he possibly imply with such an instruction as this? You know, we can only know God by how He reveals Himself to us in His Word. That's the only way we can know God. And when we summarize all that His Word tells us, we come up with the answer that's offered to us in the Westminster Shorter Catechism number four. What is God? And the answer starts off, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in His being. Now, our problem is is that we are finite creatures. We can only contemplate those kinds of characteristics, uh, even less be able to grasp them, be able to understand them, or or even to imitate them. In fact, these characteristics, God's infinity, His eternity, His unchangeableness, they're often referred to by theologians as His incommunicable attributes, the the things that that don't communicate to us. We can't, it doesn't register, we don't get it. Knowing God in these ways, you see, has actually led some theologians and some ministers, by the way, to say and to conclude, well, God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and that doesn't relate to anything. God is absolutely unknowable. He's so wholly other. He's out there. We can't relate to Him in any way, shape, or form. And we are foolish to even think that we can know God. Well, brothers and sisters, while God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, it is not true that we cannot know Him because that is not all God has revealed to us about who He is. The Westminster Shorter Catechism goes on in in questions 5 through 12 to tell us all that God has done, describing the characteristics of His triune nature, His works of creation, His works of providence, His plan and will to covenant with man, to be known by His people as a father to His children. This is God revealing Himself to us as well, as God who has a personality, a God of reality, and a God of intimate 
presence with us. And you know, while we cannot emulate and while we cannot imitate even those things perfectly, the most important lesson we learn from Scripture is that there is only one true God and He cannot be imitated, let alone contested. He cannot be overruled. He cannot be thwarted. He cannot be defeated. God is God and there is nothing and no one in all creation that can challenge Him. And then we also learn of God in other ways as well. And we go back to that question number four, to hear of, some of those things. We hear God is a spirit who exudes the attributes of wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Our God, you see, by all those characteristics, what God, what, what God is telling us is He is a moral God. He not only exhibits the qualities of His moral nature, but He tells us that He has impressed those qualities into the very being of our souls. We are made to be moral creatures. Mankind is made to be a moral creature by God to be moral. You know, the incredible truth of the matter is this, to bring it home. Not only can we, as human beings, imitate God, we were actually made by God to do just that. We were made to be imitators of God. But when we look at ourselves and we look at fallen, the fallen nature of mankind today, we look at how man conducts himself in the most immoral of ways, how he champions his sinfulness and his rebellion against God, how he throws more and more contempt on Christianity and the Word of God and the whole idea of salvation. It seems hard to fathom that he can be any different and imitating God just seems to be impossible. But you see, my friends, that is what makes the work of the Spirit so transforming. Such an incredible transformation in all of us who believe. The believer does not just try to be different. The believer doesn't just try to be better. The believer doesn't just try not to be as bad as other people. He is actually transformed. He is actually changed from the inside out. He is born from above so that he might not only be different, but that he can bear witness of that change to others in the world who need that change in their lives. Hebrews chapter 3 reminds us of that urgency, by the way. It says, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we have our original, our original confidence firm to the end. And because we are made... To know God, we're made to know God, that explains why we are also called to worship God. The believer is called to stand before his God, even as you have begun the service this morning, to worship Him in spirit and in truth, to acknowledge the one who has changed you and delivered you from death to rely on Him who is steadfast in mercy and grace and faithfulness. And then finally, Paul says here, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Now here, notice what he does. Paul returns to his doctrinal teaching. Did you see that? We could just as easily have started with the last words of the verse... For these words give us the why. We are, in fact, God's children. And then gone back to study the how. Be imitators of God. As Paul returns to his doctrinal teaching here, there's a number of things that we need to remember by way of summing up as we go forward. First is, for your salvation to be true, for your salvation to be true, it cannot be 
merely abstract. It cannot be merely philosophical. It cannot be merely intellectual. It cannot be merely traditional for that sense. We all know people who will, when you ask them directly, say, Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. But when you look at how they choose to live, when you listen to their language, when you watch their lifestyle, when you see their priorities, when you see their choices and the results of those choices, you can judge by such fruit that there is no reality in their verbal profession. We all know what kind of pressures and what kind of seductions there are in the world. How money is something that we all must earn to have, and yet how readily the love of money can draw us into priorities and choices that Christians must learn to avoid. How marriage is desired and sought after, and yet how easily our selfish preoccupations uh, can get in the way of making those marriages work. And instead, husband and wife decide to go off on their own way and do their own thing. And how those choices for the moment affect our marriages long term. And that is something that we tell ourselves, oh, we'll just deal with that later. You must be the kind of person, you must be, have the kind of family that lives according... You, you, I'm sorry, you might be... <laughs> You might be the kind of person and family that lives according to your own pragmatic rules. And can you console yourself that if you listen on, to an occasional sermon, you might be all right. And that's because in your heart of hearts, you really do not want to see this change. You really do not want to follow Jesus as a real disciple. You see, my friends, if you're like that, you're like Nicodemus in John 3. You present yourself well. You, you, you think your people admire you. You think people respect you. Uh, you even approach Jesus as a friend. You, you, you want Him to think of you as completely sincere. And so you come out with your hand out. Jesus, it's good to see you. And he's, He pushes you back. And He says something you didn't expect to hear. He says, you must be born from above or else you will not see the kingdom of heaven. When you hear that, you're flustered and you defend your sincerity, but Jesus just goes on and answers you again, and you do not understand these things. You think you had it all figured out, but Jesus tells you, you do not know Him. You're like the woman in the well, at the woman at the well in John chapter 4. You might be taken back. You might even be turned off that Jesus would ask anything of you. And that He dares to give you the impression that you choose to, what you choose to offer Him, what little perhaps you choose to offer Him, isn't going to be enough. Instead, He turns the tables on you. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is at saying to you, give me a drink, You would have asked Him, and He would have given you living water. Jesus wants you to know that if you would have the benefits of true life, you need what only He can give you. Be sure you get that in your head. It's not what you do for Jesus. It's only what Jesus can do for you. Secondly, for your salvation to be real, you must be a part of Christ's church. Except for a few exceptions, you know, Paul's letters are not written to individuals. They are written to the body of believers. They're written to the visible church. Uh, Paul's heart and life is for the visible gathering of God's people. And so as a result of that, he writes here collectively to God's beloved children. 
Belonging to Christ means belonging to Christ's church. That's an important feature. He has called you out of darkness. He's called you out of the wilderness. But He does not leave you as an orphan. He puts you into a spiritual family. So I always tell somebody, when, you, when, a, when a believer is looking for a church, maybe you have to move away and you're going to be in a whole new situation and you need to find a, a church, for a, a, a community of faith for you to be a part of. One thing I always suggest is prayerfully decide, brothers and sisters, how, how to find that right congregation. Prayerfully decide how long your shopping is going to last. Prayerfully decide how long it is your church hopping is going to last. It is vital, you see, for you to get out of that consumer attitude as fast as possible. It's important that no longer you regard yourself as a part. You think of, well, that church, I've been to that church, I've been to this church, I think I'll listen to this minister today. I think I'll watch that one online. You may not remain isolated. You may not remain uncommitted. You must become one of God's beloved children. And in third, for your salvation to be real, it must be lived out. You must grow. Paul refers to believers here as children because our relationship to Christ is not philosophical or intellectual. It is intimate. It is personal. And it is true that by the sole work of the Father, the child is the one who is chosen. The child is the one who is adopted, brought into the family, and given all of the wealth and riches that that family can provide. But calling Christians children here is more, you see, than a, an expression of divine uh, affection. It's an accurate description of what lies ahead of all of us. Children do not possess all that they need to know for life, even our kids. They, they do not know how they are to live in the family of faith and about how they are to be different from the world right off the bat. Children are in need of instruction. In most every area of life, and the later you come into the family of God, the more you need to learn. Sometimes children will learn readily. Sometimes they'll learn willingly, while at other times they see what others are doing and they think, why not? Right? Why not? Why can't I do that? What's wrong with it? And they want to behave in a worldly way and they won't think much else of it. But the children of God need to be learning of their Father's will. That's the most important thing a child can do, is learn from their Father. That will take clear instruction. That will take clear direction. That will take clear correction. That will take encouragement. That will take modeling. That will take discipline. But that will also come, my friends, with great and heavenly rewards and the increased blessings upon themselves from one covenant generation to the next to the next. That is why in the last half of Paul's letter is now before us, and I want you to remember this as we go forward, how precious it is to know God as our heavenly Father and the beauty of His holiness and His morality and His steadfastness, so that we might set ourselves to follow and imitate Him in the how we live our lives, how we live our relationships, how we live in the world. We be to begin the process of growing, to confront the need for change 
in, yes, in our lives, and to seek His pleasure in following after Him. Let's pray.